What's the best way to end a video game? It's a question that's plagued many a developer for decades with answers ranging from loud and bombastic to quiet and somber and even just not ending it at all. The truth is that there is no one right answer, but there's plenty of wrong ones and an even larger number of terrible ways of hiding them away from the player. Standard endings don't usually require anything special since that would be stupid and vastly unnecessary, but on the off chance that there's more than one ending to unlock, the criteria to do so can get pretty silly. Just depends how crazy you want things to get. There's a line of logic that says that the people who are interested in going out of their way to getting an extra ending will be willing to tick off a long list of boxes so you can get away with asking them to do things that they usually wouldn't be all that interested in. There's definitely a limit though, and I can only be so interested in an ending. I mean, I can find closure in other parts of my life, don't you worry about that. I admire the creativity though. I guess endings are what we're all aiming for when we play games, so you can really wring players dry and see how badly they want to see those extra endings. Games have struggled for a long time to get the right balance of reward with the effort required to get there, and so it's no surprise when so many games ask for blood in order to give you more options for a canonical ending. They're a good goal to aim for as some kind of post-game, but when hidden endings get really hard to unlock, I feel like I have to step in with a video all about them. After all, the end is a hell of a time to ruin your video game. It's not a lot of time to fix things afterwards. Older games are very specific with their endings. The first game recognised as having an ending is likely Crystal Castle from 1983, which means there's a lot of open-ended games before and after that time that simply don't have endings. I mean, some of them have kill screens where some arcade games crap out after a certain number of levels because of a programming oversight, but an integer overflow shouldn't be the deciding factor in giving your game an ending. A lot of games didn't have endings because they wanted at least something close to endless replayability and so kept things going until enemies or obstacles overwhelmed the player. But with a game like Ghosts and Goblins, not only is this kind of impossible since the game has clearly defined levels, but also mostly unnecessary. No one would ever want this game to go on forever. Twice through is already pushing things. Ghosts and Goblins is home to one of the original and most crushing plot twists in gaming history. It's not quite at the same calibre as Samus Aran being a woman this whole time, but somewhere above your princess being in another castle, although not too dissimilar. The difference is that Super Mario Bros is a lot more forgiving than Ghosts and Goblins and bases its level structure and technically story progression on a plot twist with diminishing returns. Meanwhile, Ghosts and Goblins lays out the whole game in front of you and asks you to play everything again on a higher difficulty on the off chance that you care enough to see the true ending. And hey, it's a good ending. A happy end, even, that fills me with so much strength that replaying a very hard game on an even harder difficulty setting isn't much of a problem for me. At least this way you have ultimate bragging rights and you're able to say that you saw Ghosts and Goblins' true ending. What did it cost, though? I think it's great that Ghosts and Goblins tries to match a traditional ending with the more recognised replayability of games at the time, the issue is that as soon as you beat the final boss, he swoops in and steals your girl again, which means that you're bumped back to the start, you keep your points, so the game is actually looping back in on itself, meaning that playing the game again on a harder difficulty to get a true ending didn't actually matter at all. Bet you don't feel as satisfied now. You might be relieved to know how many games out there hide their true ending behind a repeat playthrough. It's a hollow victory, where the solidarity that comes with knowing that multiple games have pulled this trick is offset with the reality that you've worked yourself up to watch your efforts be adequately rewarded with a satisfying ending, only to put everything on hold until you can muster the patience to do it all again. It's a tough gig, but some games are worth that repeat playthrough, especially if there are numerous different paths for you to explore on your way back to the finish line. Shadow the Hedgehog is a game that does all of these things and has plenty for you to sink your teeth into if you really desperately want that true ending. It's just that I don't really care that much. To be frank, if any game pulled the kind of shit that Shadow the Hedgehog tries to get away with, I'd probably be just as upset. 
Unless maybe it was something fun and short, like the Stanley Parable, that could work. But Shadow the Hedgehog is about as far removed from the kind of clever writing and enjoyable replay value that are both required to make this work. It's an interesting concept, since the objectives you pursue will influence the good or evil alignment that takes you down the relevant path to defeat a boss that will net you one of ten endings based on how you play played through the story. Only after seeing every ending do you then unlock the true ending, which is the only ending that matters, since everything else isn't canon and basically just a massive waste of time. There's no getting away from the fact that in order to see the true ending of Shadow the Hedgehog, you need to play Shadow the Hedgehog all the way through ten times, and at least for me, one time was more than enough. Instead, I get to play to the end once, experience all the crap this game has to give, and then see an ending that doesn't even matter anyway. And if I really want to see the true ending, that's kind of what YouTube's for. It's good to know that nothing matters and this game will soak up all of your enthusiasm for anything good in life. But hey, at least there's a game out there where you can make Shadow into some kind of diabolical villain. I'm sure someone out there loves this. I enjoy most endings that I have to work hard for. It's important to me that an ending has value, otherwise I don't feel like I've earned my way to the end of the game. I suppose there's always going to be shortcuts to this as a more immediate reward, but getting to the end of, say, a Dark Souls game is unbelievably satisfying to me. I don't need to tell you that there are polar opposites to this. We're in the age of charging money for trivial things that are usually free, so it's natural progression that this would extend to endings. You know, something that is kind of required for a game to be considered finished? Yeah, I wish more companies would charge players for the privilege of finishing the story of their game. To be fair to Capcom, this was not the original plan with Asura's Wrath. It's a game of a very deliberate episodic structure like your favourite anime, but it would still be a bit of a stretch to suggest that Capcom were deliberately trying to wring money out of players who were already invested in the story. Supposedly, Capcom wanted to leave the thread dangling at the end of Asura's Wrath so that a sequel would continue the story. Instead, the cliffhanger was repurposed into a stinger that promotes DLC, which is a clever bit of recycling to promote this downloadable content, but also really dodgy looking. PR would be furious. It's a bad look in isolation. Asura's Wrath is a fairly recognisable final mission where most story beats are wrapped up in a satisfying way as you blow fire out of a hole in the earth by destroying some weird lava monster and so Asura is reunited with his daughter and the credits roll in a rewarding ending with everything tied up. But hey, actually no, since you can always part with a hefty chunk of cash to unlock episode 19, which contains the game's true ending involving the spider and this angry Buddha looking guy and some of the flashiest visuals you're ever likely to see in a game. It's wonderful to see and play and definitely worth the price of admission, but not really when in the context of the game's true ending. DLC should always be added content, and there's no way you can spin Asura's Wrath's true ending that fits that criteria, and even with the story of a botched sequel to help fight its corner, this still ends up feeling distasteful. If you really wanted all of these crazy visuals that clearly took up a lot of time and effort, you shouldn't have hidden them behind a paywall. Doesn't seem all that worth it to me. Fire Emblem is some shit, isn't it? Not exactly one for multiple endings in recent times, since they've got this ambitious narrative going on with opposing factions and shock reveals are plenty, and so they spend all this time working towards one ending where all of these narrative threads converge, but that's not to say that this has always been the case. Older Fire Emblem games have more than just a passing resemblance to their more modern counterparts, but there's a bit more to chew on when it comes to alternate endings and different things you can do throughout your adventure to affect how it comes together at the end. And I don't mean the character summaries that you get after the credits roll that tells you how each unit spent the rest of their lives. No, 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 we've got legendary weapons to look after and specific units to keep alive and chapters that have to be finished inside a certain number of turns. Yeah, that sounds stupid enough to talk about. I first played Fire Emblem The Binding Blade about four or five years ago, having played a ton of other Fire Emblem games that don't have special requirements for unlocking the true ending. So I played it blissfully unaware that there were things I could be doing that give each character the perfect ending, and I'm just wondering now, should I feel bad about that? Because I really don't. Honestly, how can you feel bad for not doing something that no one told you about? 
Fire Emblem The Binding Blade does have a true ending that is maybe worth the time you need to commit to jumping through all of those hoops, but I'm not so sure I can muster the care to fine tooth comb my way through so many chapters. Keeping all of the legendary weapons is probably the easiest thing to do, since you can always use an A rank weapon instead, but it's also the easiest thing to mess up accidentally, since I saw the numbers they were putting out and slapped them on my strongest units straight away like a fool! By the time the first one broke, it didn't matter that I didn't recruit every possible unit or that I took too long in some chapters, because to have that many balls in the air at the same time is something you need to set out to do from the start. Even then, the true ending isn't all that great since Roy and Guinevere chat shit that somehow leads to one of them recommending that if you're enjoying this video, then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications of every new upload. Not completely pointless, but it feels like it most of the time when you could be having lots of fun with legendary weapons instead. You can see why future games decided to play things fairly straight and stick to one ending. I'd rather have one good ending instead of anything that I have to work too hard for. I have simple needs. You know what terrifies me more than anything else in the world? Endings that are only available upon 100% completion of everything in the game. I know, it's weird. Most people are scared of things like spiders or clowns, or the legendary spider clown, but for me it's a thought that I'd have to do everything in a game to see the true ending. 100% completion should always be optional, with it either being its own reward or having more of an end game prize, like the Fierce Deity's Mask from Majora's Mask. Hiding the true ending behind 100% is a really shitty thing to do. And it's one thing making it a boring quest like finding all the Riddler trophies in Batman Arkham Knight, but Final Fantasy X-2 has a giant list of bullshit that all contributes to one true ending that doesn't even add anything substantial. So that's good to know ahead of time, now I know not to care. There are so many places to trip up when pursuing 10-2's perfect ending. If you've ever followed a walkthrough for a game where it feels like you'll make a huge mistake if you do one bit of independent thinking, then you'll know exactly how it feels to play Final Fantasy X-2 of 100% completion in mind. This comes from a lot of events that add to the completion percentage being missable once you move on to bigger and better things, so you really have to go through the game step by step and make sure that you're talking to the right people at the right time, otherwise you can kiss your fancy pants true ending goodbye. You can lose completion percentage by choosing the wrong option when talking to someone, so the idea that you could unlock the true ending by accident or through the natural flow of playing the game would be stretching the truth to breaking point. There's plenty of guides online if you want to give this a go, but the whole concept of creeping your way through a game to see the perfect ending doesn't feel right. Games shouldn't be this much work for something so mundane. This is Mapple Luigi, and I do like Final Fantasy X-2's true ending because it gives Yuna and Titus a chance to talk about whether or not all of this is a dream, which is a nice little touch but it doesn't really justify all of the effort you did to get this far and in truth, no ending would ever be enough because like I said, tying 100% completion to any kind of ending just, it, it doesn't feel satisfying enough. So, so don't even bother. Just make it so that doing everything changes all of their heads into pumpkins. Then you'd have my attention. Have you got a topic that you'd like me to talk about next week? Make sure you leave a comment about that down below because I'll be taking the most interesting suggestions and making a poll on the next video. In fact, here's one right now that I prepared from last week. I'll be revealing the winner of the poll on Twitter and taking suggestions for games to talk about that are related to that topic. So feel free to follow me over there so we can keep in touch. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.